The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Raising capital or taking your business to the world? Investment Fix has everything you need to make it happen. This season, we're exploring the US market, the opportunities it offers, what it takes to grow a business there, and the best way to approach investors. The Investment Fix Podcast. Tune in today. The Fold is brought to you by O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. No mai hoki mai ki the Fold e mihine ko Duncan Grieve talking wa. My guest this week is Elise Sturbeck, who is the former ED of The Basement, which is a very pop venue and, and uh, theatre place in Auckland, one which I definitely, in terms of my personal engagement with, with those scenes, have been to more and definitely had more good times at than, uh, than any other. Um, and certainly she was uh, up you know, there or thereabouts in terms of running the thing for much of that period. Um, but she's, she's since resigned and is currently partway through a PhD, which is basically on how we fund arts. Because as long as I've been aware that arts were a thing, I've been aware that the way we fund it really doesn't work for practitioners within the arts and cultural spaces. It becomes this very corrosive, competitive, sort of soul-sucking process of applying for funding. And as Elise mentions, your dominant experience of wanting to make things is being rejected for the opportunity to make them. And she recently wrote a, a kind of a paradigm for an alternative, which which we talk about, a kind of a lottery-based system, which on some level both sounds like what people think it already is and also sounds completely absurd and yet in some respects maybe it's maybe it's actually worth t- taking seriously so we we essentially use that as a as a launching pad to talk about the way that we currently fund things how that came about how it impacts people and and ultimately where where that might go and and what sort of experiments might be triggered you know she is very much early stages of this thing and I think you know potentially it might be worth coming back out the other side of seeing how she she makes it but um but ultimately you know there are a few people who've had so much recent up close and personal experience with the the sort of trials and and uh, triumphs of making the arts happen uh, right up close than than Elise and uh, I think it's a really interesting quarter about how about how this this Brilliant, difficult, um, super important, but also feels like it always has to justify itself. Sector uh, operates in 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 this area. Uh, this is Elise Sturbeck on Fold. Tanakwe, Elise, and uh, welcome to the Fold. Tanakwe, great to be here. So we've got we've got a lot to get through in this very simple and chilled out sector. But I wondered if before we start, you could. Give me a sense of, of how you ended up here in this uh, fascinating, highly charged environment that is the sort of arts and cultural sector. Yeah, um, I started off as a student studying politics and I've always been into the arts and had artist parents and so somehow that combined with that political interest and um, yeah, I started off at that at a young age wanting to be an advocate for artists and creative things and um, got involved with a group called Creative Coalition, which was forming around the time of the Super City in Auckland. And they were really concerned about the role that the arts was going to play in Auckland post that because you had Rodney Hyde at the time making all sorts of threats. Uh, So that was a really amazing exposure to leaders in the industry and just how the whole thing worked. For me, and through that, I actually met um, the founder of Basement Theatre, Charlie McDermott, and then ended up joining the team there as a marketing community um, engagement person. And so I was at Basement for seven years, um, and I really saw it as an opportunity uh, to get that on the ground experience of what it takes to make art happen in New Zealand. So, I mean, you, you weren't just at Basement, you were, you were running the, the whole shop, is that? Yeah, by the end of my time there, 
I'd so, so, reach that height. <laughs> totally. And I mean, I guess like I, I'm a, a, a huge fan of, of Basement and I think it's got this, it's where you see in micro a, a, a sense of what a really well-realised kind of cultural sector can do, the way it can interact with a number of different um, sort of forms and communities and, and so on. And what what did you learn there? Because what you end up doing, because on some level it's a platform where a whole bunch of people can stage their, their sort of dreams, but you inevitably have proximity to what's really hard for them and where beautiful things break as well as are formed and, and distributed. What, what did you sort of see there that has informed what you've gone on to do subsequently? Yeah, I mean, it is. It, basement was a little microcosm in itself, and it's um, it was great to really immerse myself in a community of such passionate, creative people. And I think what um, I saw at the independent artist level was that struggle for sustainability, and at an audience level, this kind of lack of understanding of the relationship between public support and then selling tickets. And so there's this sort of com- semi-commercial aspect, but a very heavy reliance on public funding. And so artists trying to bring together projects that are going to pay them, but also realise their artistic vision and the fullness of what that is. Um, and then working within that organisational space, just understanding how an organisation like that is viable and in order to support be and be a platform for a community of artists um all the yeah funds that you have to access and fight for and advocate for why you have value in Auckland and to a community and yeah and I think definitely on a very personal level for me I experienced the burnout that comes from that of just jumping through those endless funding hoops and reporting and trying to prove your case while also keeping the doors open and looking after your team and looking after the community of artists you're supporting. So, yeah, it was a lot. (laughs) It does does sound like a lot, honestly. So what I'm curious about, and you referred to it um, in passing there, is for those who don't know, and that honestly probably includes many people working in the sector whose income relies on them knowing to an extent, the, the funding for... Yeah, the basement or even some of uh, what gets put on there is a weird kind of patchwork. A lot of there's a lot of different pots of money which might plausibly be deployed in different capacities to achieve different ends. And you know, for 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 the uninitiated, you know, and you you are I think doing a PhD in this on some level right now, literally. You know, can you just sort of top line what the 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 sector looks like from a, a sort of a funding perspective, like how, how the non-commercial side of it uh, is made. Yeah, sure. So um, Basement, let's start there, was funded um, mostly through Creative New Zealand, which is um, the kind of agency that is supported by an arts council. And the arts council is a, a model we've inherited from the UK Um and we've had it in place since the 60s. And so the Arts Council is funded by the Ministry of Culture and Heritage, Manatū Taonga, um, and then that receives allocations of funding from government. But also the Arts Council um, receives money from the Lotteries Commission, just like sport relies on that as well. So there's an allocation from gambling that comes from that too. Um, and then, at, so Creative New Zealand has kind of core investment clients. Basement was one of those. So they call them Tōtara and Kahikatea, which is kind of two tiers of um, leadership, I guess, in the sector. It sort of recognises what makes up the kind of core infrastructure of the arts community. Um, and then on top of that baseline funding that you get from a funder like Creative New Zealand, Um, You're also looking for support from your local government um, and from philanthropic and community trusts and different various gambling trusts to pay for some new seats or, you know, (laughs) and you'll also have your collection of patrons and your crowdfunding exercises and, yeah, it is a patchwork for sure. Yeah, you could could sense, I remember seeing 
one night where I, I, you heard someone like New Zealand's greatest comedians writing very funny songs about needing to pay for, for literal seats while you're sitting on the old ones. And it's like, yeah, that really shows just how close to the edge this, this venue is operating. So, you know, th- this is basically like a, you know, the, the kind of situation normal that the sector operates in. It's just, it's, it's scratching to survive and, and then COVID hits and just sort of explodes everything. And the practice of what you're doing is somewhere between really hard and literally illegal for large portions of the last couple of years. And that that kind of seemed to, from my perspective, elicit two things from um, government, one of which was we we will try and do what we can to, to bridge through here. And there was a general, and this isn't located um, solely in arts and culture, it was like, oh, sh- well, should we use this as an opportunity to kind of fix our shop? So do you, do you want to talk about how the sector traversed that as it's coming out and, and what what government or, or, or the MCH or, or CNZ did and to what extent it did or didn't impact the the kind of the change that, that is almost perpetually um, asked for by the sector? Yeah, so um, what the government's response was, which was pretty amazing really, was to allocate COVID relief funding to the arts um, and that ended up being across the pandemic almost half a billion dollars, which is sort of unprecedented for our sector. Um, and they, uh, the majority of that was really towards a kind of survival purpose to cover events that were cancelled or to save um, organisations that might be on the brink of collapse, uh, as well as uh, paying out sort of one-off grants to individual practitioners who'd suffered losses from cancellations and disruptions for COVID. So it's sort of the idea is to keep the whole thing afloat. And and I think on the whole, I mean, without any kind of real evaluation having happened of that yet, I think that, that has been somewhat effective. I think the tragedy of it was it very much was a temporary stopgap. But when you've got that amount of resource going into a sector that has never gone before, there was potential for real transformative change. And I don't know whether um, we've seen any initiatives or strategy and the distribution of that money that is going to have like a transformative impact on our sector in the long term. Um, Manishu Tang has just announced a regeneration fund that is about to open today, I think it is. And... I think that is looking more into the medium term and they've kind of um, pivoted a bit and um, re-assigned some of their funds towards this new purpose of thinking about a more sustainable, resilient sector. So that holds some promise, I think, for this. But um, if you compare it to Ireland's response um, to support the arts through the pandemic, they um, did some research really early on in the process formed a strategy, uh, got a task force together, and their top recommendation was um, to support artist income. So they developed a kind of basically like a universal basic income for artists that cost them about $40 million um, and supported 2,000 artists at $500 a week for three years. So that's kind of like a, a really strategic intervention that's trialling like a whole new way of engaging with and supporting the art sector. Um, and really, it, you know, that $40 million represents 10% or less than 10% of what our government's put into this COVID relief fund. But um, it is a big chunk of money that can have that impact, whereas what we've done with our money is kind of spread it across, spread it around everywhere, and everyone's got a little piece. But it's like whether those pieces will add up to anything really being different in the long term. Yeah, it's it's interesting, right? There, there tends to be, it, it's easier to fund infrastructure than ongoing operational costs within arts and culture is, is what is sort of a, a general kind of thesis. And most artists will be like, oh, I would just quite like to, to live kind of thing. But, you know, for, for some people listening, and, and, you know, this is, and certainly for parts of the population at large, large and you kind of alluded to it with the reference to, to Rodney Hyde, that... The the idea of funding arts is, you know, would would seem like 
you know, anathema, like this, this thing should be funded by its audiences. You, you will have heard the, uh, the arguments many times. What, what is the, the, the response of the, man, industry is not the right word, of the sector <laughs> to, to, to that kind of position? Like how, how, does, it, how does it justify these, the, the contribution that does come out of, of, the, of government towards yeah. it? The old... Um valuing the arts <laughs> question. I mean, we are always grappling with that. But actually, I think there's been so much evidence gathered around this. Um, I think we've really seen in the pandemic the role that the arts play in our lives. I mean, for me, I think the arts are the sign of vitality in our society, that we're moving beyond just surviving, existing, being productive workers in an, in an economy, you know. And I think... During this pandemic time, we've really felt pro- most most of us from our employers that urge to continue to be productive despite disruption, and we've retreated into our homes and um, yeah, and we may be feeling the depression or disconnection that comes from that kind of isolation. And I think that's got a lot to do with um, arts experiences kind of dropping out of our lives and everything that they bring, like an opportunity to socialise with each other, to connect, to feel part of a community, um, to feel belonging. Um, So I think uh, we've also heard about this, like, shadow pandemic um, where it's running alongside this health crisis, but we also have these increased levels of anxiety, stress, um, anger, frustration, distrust that has resulted in all these, you know, societal divisions that we've seen over this time increasing. Um, And there's just such great evidence from the arts about, and neuroscientists have looked at how having creative experiences and that ability to kind of embody the joy and magic and collectiveness that comes from creative and arts experiences can impact on that stress experience that we have. And if um, if we don't have that in our lives, then that's when we start to, you know, things start to fall apart. I think we've all sort of <laughs> come close to that at times during those oh, yeah. lockdowns. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I think the evidence is out there. And actually um, in a recent survey that Creative New Zealand did, most New Zealanders do support public funding of the arts. So I think that is understood. But it is one of those ethereal things that you have to keep kind of making more concrete. and <laughs> You sort of know it when you see it, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, uh, when you've experienced it. Yeah. Mm. So the, the the reason that we're we're talking is because you essentially, you, you set out a... a a bit of a, I don't know if manifesto is the right word, but it was certainly a very provocative challenge to the existing system. And I want to talk about that and about why you, you know, what what prompted that. But really, I think that to, to before we get there, you need to sort of explain why the current system, this patchworking, the the sort of the differing funds and the contestability of it, the, the way that you have, the things, that, the shapes that you have to bend yourself into to access that funding, uh, you know, why it, it doesn't seem to work in any kind of a sustainable way for, for anyone. Like you don't find people who say, yeah, just lo- love the way the arts are funded, just cracking, <laughs> let's, let's keep going. Yeah, what, what, what's, what's not working to your mind? Yeah, I think the biggest problem I have is with the um, contestable approach to funding that it just exists everywhere at all in all of those different systems I described at national levels with Create New Zealand, at um, local government, the philanthropic ones, they're all using essentially the same model of send us an application, we'll assess it, make a decision, and then then you need to do a bunch of reporting to prove that you did what you said and it, it worked. And it's and that's the kind of hoops that we talk about in the sector. And I think with more funding that we've had through the COVID relief scheme and whenever new funds come along, it's the same approach and it just adds another another hoop, you know. And so I think in this the last couple of years in particular, 
when there's been so much disruption and so much um, adapting that arts organisations and artists have had to do to this new environment and then also um, just to survive, then um, go through more of these contestable processes. It's just, um, it, it, I think, it introduces a lot of fatigue um, and creates that burnout experience in the sector. So, yeah, I I um, put forward that provocation um, not as the um, best solution, but just because I think it's so important that we have these discussions and that they come from the sector and come from people who have lived that experience of being a funding applicant and who are practising artists. Yeah, to really examine why, how, why and how the structure that we live in works and how it could be better. The Fold is brought to you by O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa, with over 4,000 out of home advertising sites nationwide across both street furniture and retail centres. I'm super grateful to O Media for enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. Raising capital or taking your business to the world? Investment Fix has the lowdown on everything you need to make it happen. This season, we're exploring the US market the opportunities it offers, what it takes to grow a business there, and the best way to approach investors. Join some of the superstars of the investment and business world as they share advice from their time in the US so you can make your mahi count in this massive market. The Investment Fix Podcast, brought to you by Invest New Zealand. Tune in today. Skinny are helping you show how smart you are with the 1Q Quiz, an all-new, super-challenging and super-quick daily quiz built by The Spin-Off. Every Monday, Skinny are giving you the chance to prove you're smart with the Skinny Extra Credit question. Get it right, and you'll get the chance to score yourself some Skinny Extra mobile credit so you can text, call, or even video call your group chat and gloat about how big your brain is. T's and C's apply. So tell me what you proposed, you know, which was on some level a, a kind of lottery and yet for, for all that, that, you know, that, that can seem just like a, a you know, a joke or, or a satire of, of, you know, that's often how people describe it already, it did seem like there was some underlying seriousness of intent, uh, you know, in, in terms of what, what you were suggesting. Yeah, I guess... For me, um, it was critiquing the way things are, but also wanting to offer an alternative. So, and and I guess wanting to acknowledge how arbitrary some of these supposedly kind of fair and rational processes that we have around funding decision making are, um, because actually, due to the scarcity of the funds available, even if we as funders love an idea, it often doesn't get funded. So, and and I think the harm of that is that you then have so many amazing ideas and amazing amazing practitioners just experiencing constant rejection and how demoralising that is and how, how much that, I think, kind of suppresses and disrupts your own creative process and the confidence that you need to be an artist in the first place, to put yourself out there and your ideas out there. So, yeah, I think that is what prompted me to um, try and think of a different way and taking this more kind of lottery approach where people are randomly selected and it's not about subjectively which idea do we think is better or who do we think is a better artist, um, which is always a tricky conversation and and is very personal right it's always going to be a personal preference so how do we make that a bit more random and also encourage more and more ideas to come into that pool so yeah I guess where we got to with um, because I had a discussion with a number of people to kind of come up with this utopian vision uh, but was the idea that uh, we this all of these applications could go into one pool. Some of them might randomly get selected and funded, but otherwise they would stay in there until they did get funded and it would become a shared database because I think what we really lack in the sector is data and kind of knowledge of 
all these ideas that are being pitched, they go in, to, they go in for assessment and then they never get looked at again. But actually so much creative time, ideas, energy has gone into crafting how this project could get off the ground and why it would be an amazing experience for people um, and just to have it tossed out after the, each funding round feels like such a waste to me. So if we were to gather them over time, make it available so that then it becomes a process of funders, producers, corporates, anyone who's looking for a creative idea, looking for a collaboration, can scour this database and approach artists. So it's kind of a flipping of the script, really. Then we might just generate a whole different kind of energy and dynamism in the sector. And we also, I think, over time would get a sense of the total creative potential of our nation because we would have this pool of all the ideas that was growing over time. And from a government funding level, you could look at that and say, yeah, let's make it all happen. This is the total value of what that would cost. Um, Yeah, instead of it all being hidden behind these kind of closed funding doors, I guess. It's interesting, right, because, you know, and I think this is true of any situation where there is contestable funding is that there's there's always a sense from those who are seeking the funding that there are, you know, that the that those making the decisions, like as you say, sometimes you can really like something. It doesn't, um, but it's a it's a limited pool. There's also, you know, there can be gaps between, you know, often whether it's um, you know, you know, Maori collectors or collectives or or like um, you know Asian uh, Pan Asian practitioners there are communities where if it doesn't meet the right person on the right day or they you know the, a sense that that assessing these things at all is incredibly hard and that we should not necessarily as a as a sector be, be married to one particular way of producing it uh, of of addressing that which is inevitably basically just plucking winners out and hoping that that we're right and then are just abandoning all the rest of it. The the Irish example that you so- cited earlier sounded quite fascinating too because on some level, like, you know, it, it basically like, it, it, it almost, it, yeah, it's like a UBI but, but for artists, um, a universal basic income, which, you know, it's almost like if you could do a control group and just see what, which which approach, given the same pool of money, produced more work and 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 more work that reached more more people? I think that would be quite a an interesting experiment to run. Do, do you do you have any sense that there is within whether it's MCH, CNZ, or the sector more broadly, an appetite for taking a a radical step like that, or is it, or, or are the systems uh, that we currently have? too entrenched for that? Uh, yeah, I think I think there is some appetite for it. And I think that's what's been cool about this disruptive time. And, and I think we have been having these conversations and looking at different ways of doing things. And I think that's what's been awesome about Manatu Taonga kind of coming into the conversation in a big way and experiencing what it is to be a direct funder to the sector for the first time in a long time and, and and then through that understanding all of the needs and gaps and that the sector has. So I know that actually they, um, a pilot of that kind of UBI approach was funded um, through Creative Waikato. So they're going to do a very small scale version of that. So I think through some of this COVID relief funding, we will see some prototypes coming through that maybe over time will attract greater investment that may have a kind of more wide-reaching result. Yeah. Yeah, it's because it's, it's interesting, right? Like, I think, I, I think about what, what you said before about, you know, confidence is just such a crucial thing for anyone practising in these areas, and we, yet we make them go through a process where the, the dominant experience they will have is of being told this thing, this dog's not going to hunt, this is, this is not going to get made and how quickly and we'll all have been around people who come in late teens early 20s just nothing but idealism just get beaten and beaten beaten and by you know 10 years on late 20s early 30s they're really quite corroded by the experience and 
that's not just that's not atypical. That's almost the dominant archetype of you know the the rare person is the person who retains their unflagging enthusiasm despite all that. So it does feel like it's worth trying something else. Do you is there is there anywhere in the world? I mean, you cited that that Irish example. Are there kind of thriving uh, sort of arts creative uh, sectors anywhere in the world which sort of feel like they contain in them uh, like lessons that we could could absorb that sort of feel like that they, they might be um, you know might show us a, a, a different approach like like that because you're you're sort of researching this right now right like this this, yeah. this feels. It's there funny. must be some. It's there's so much utopianism within the arts in terms of. The, I wish it could be this way. Is there? Is it this way anywhere? <laughs> well, I don't know if I've done enough research to be able to conclusively <laughs> state that. But I guess actually where I'm going with a lot of my work is wanting to move away from searching for solutions outside of Aotearoa um, because that's been the history of arts policy in a way, especially in New Zealand. We look elsewhere for how people are doing things and we, you know, it's that, I guess, part of that cultural cringe thing we've always had, but we think it's always better somewhere else and we just need to import it here and and replicate that. But I think in so many ways, New Zealand can lead the world if we develop approaches that are sourced um, in this land, you know, and because we are so lucky to have, um, you know, te ao Māori and, and te kanga Māori and a gui- guidance from our Indigenous people who have such a rich cultural history and to see that um, being further revitalised, I think just there's more and more potential. For example, um, I know a lot of people that work in kind of youth arts development programs and a lot of those programs are led by Māori and Pacific ways of doing things and they're recognised around the world for being unique approaches. So I think and that's that's playing out in so many different parts of our sector. So I think what we're missing actually is the recognition of how valuable and special what we have here already is and investing in that further and um, placing te tiriti and te ao Māori at the heart of our cultural strategy going forward. That's what I think will really be a game changer for us. Yeah, you're so right about that, this, like, like the typical thing. And you get it in a way, like if you've got a hundred and, you know, or a couple of hundred countries that you who are all essentially running their own real-time experiment, um, those of them that have arts programs at all, it's probably less than half that number. But you know, so the 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 idea of looking overseas makes sense. But but you know, what what you suggest is that what we have here and being more confident and and assertive and in what is uniquely ours that makes makes a lot of sense. So to finish, just tell me a little bit about the the, the, the PhD you're doing and what what it is you hope to sort of surface out of that and where you'd like to see it go. Yeah, um, I came into it you know, just wanting to study systemic change and cultural policy and it's such a kind of underdeveloped space in New Zealand. We don't really have a um, concrete national arts strategy or, yeah, any kind of set of policies. So it's a space I really want to have an impact on eventually. Um, But my supervisor, Peter O'Connor, he's um, well known for practice in applied theatre and using theatre as research processes. So through working with him, I've kind of revised my approach in a much more exciting direction, I think, to use work with a group of creatives, with artists, and exploring the system together through a kind of theatre-based approach. So kind of the same process we would do in devising a show we'll go into a rehearsal room together and try and grapple with some of these big questions about the creative ecosystem. And that kind of ecology approach is what I'm really interested in about as well, because this um, arts, the history of kind of arts policy has been dominated by a very industrial kind of lens, you know, creative industries and what's the role the arts play in our economy. And that's kind of been what everyone's cared about 
for the last few decades. And so I'm really interested in a, a more holistic lens on that and looking at how everything's interconnected. Basically, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Like, you can imagine Treasury just absolutely flipping out at the idea of, like, theatering your way to, <laughs> to policy. But then, you know, at, at the same time, like, who is going to know more about the, the challenges of, of viability within the arts than people actually practicing it every day? So, uh, well, that's, that's exciting to, to hear that. Good, good, good luck with that. And thanks so much for coming on The Fold today, Elise. Awesome. Thanks for the chat, Duncan. The Fold was brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network, together with Daylight. It was hosted by Duncan Grieve, produced by T.I. Hair Butler, with production management by Rachel LaRue and series production by Jane Yee. That was The Fold, brought to you by our partners at O-Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. Huge thanks to O-Media for sponsoring this episode of The Fold and enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.